Okay, welcome back to week 12, American Lit 4, our final video presentation. We've come a long way in the last three months. A lot of great uh, uh, reflections uh, by you and uh, some great uh, projects that you did for our story, The Abundance of Catherine's. One last big project, our research paper. Uh, most of you have uh, sent your three uh, topic choices, so focus in on one and go for it. So today uh, we're going to talk about uh, and review our two stories from last week's uh, Six Rows of Flowers and growing up Asian American. Then we're going to uh, introduce uh, America's greatest contemporary poet, uh, Bob Dylan. We're gonna talk about uh, his life and one of his famous works, uh, Home, made famous by Jimi Hendrix, uh, entitled All Along the Watchtower. We're going to talk about a song called Vincent. We're going to talk about one of America's most famous movies, uh, The Wizard of Oz, which was originally a book, a theatrical production, and then made into a movie, uh, highlighting the main song uh, from the movie, uh, Somewhere Over the Rainbow. And then some parting uh, advice uh, from a commencement speech entitled Sunscreen. So that's our direction for today. And we'll move on to the next slide. Okay, so let's talk about our two uh, readings uh, from last week. Our first story, uh, Six Rows of Pompons by Toshio Mori. So when uh, nephew uh, Taatsu uh, comes to live at a Japanese immigrant owned uh, flower nursery in Yokohama, California. He's uh, seven years old. And although uh, his little mind doesn't know it, everything he did was opposite of adult conduct. His uncle, Uncle Hiroshi, after witnessing several weeks of rampage, says, this has got to stop, but he doesn't want to crush the boy's curiosity. So he gives him six rows of pompons to take care of. He says, you own these six rows, you take care of them, make them grow and flower like your uncles. At the end, you can sell them and keep the money. So, Tiatsu has good intentions in the beginning, but he's very forgetful and has many problems keeping the flowers alive. His plants become infested with bugs. He doesn't weed the flower beds. He doesn't water them correctly. A gopher invades his plants. By autumn, there are only a few plants left. Uncle Hiroshi cuts the flowers and sells them in the flower market where they sold for 25 cents. Yatsu spends the money on ice cream, a movie, he watches a baseball game, where he buys some popcorn, and he saves five cents. His father says he is beyond a doubt the worst gardener in the country probably the worst in the world. Uncle Hiroshi 
give him another chance next year. After all, it is the family business, and someday he will play an important part in the family flower business. The theme is that responsibility can be taught by experience rather than punishment. So in our next story, uh, Growing Up Asian in America by Kisea Noda. This is from a website by Paul Ginto, ePortfolio, Identity, Privilege, and Inequality, an analysis with Adaptation Project. He states, in Growing Up Asian, in America by Kesia Inoda. She talks about the difficulty growing up as a Japanese American in America. While she speaks specifically of her Japanese culture, the greater theme of Noda's story is that of identity and the hardship that comes with growing up as an Asian American. But still, staying true to important aspects of culture, beliefs, values, and dialect. In her story, she describes many encounters with non-Asian people and the stereotypes that were perpetuated by them. There's a quote from the story that goes directly to the heart and true meaning of what Noda was trying to convey, quote, how is one to know and define oneself? In the case of Asian Americans, how does one stand by their identity and their culture, but still acknowledge themselves as an American as well? Many common experiences um, amongst many young Asian Americans include the rejection of their Asian roots and culture just to be able to fit in with everyone else from Asian nation. But where does this kind of thinking come from? According to an article in Time Magazine, it comes from an early age of kids who desperately want to belong in a society that looks as Asians as stereotypes perpetuated by media, such as in television or movies, where many Asians were depicted as socially awkward nerds, experts in martial arts, or a foreign villain. Plus, early on in the 1980s, for instance, there were, just weren't a lot of Asian Americans. In a census conducted in 1980, Asian Americans accounted for 3 million or 1% of the total population of people living in the United States today. Interesting to note, that is the same or about the same population of Native Americans living in the United States today. That kind of racial alienation and ethnic mockery were commonplace amongst immigrants growing up in the United States. But according to Harvard University sociologist, Mary Waters, previous generations of immigrant kids, including those like Italians and Jews, lived in neighborhoods with built-in social support structures. People who looked like them, ate like them, prayed like them. That is something that many Asian Americans just didn't have for themselves. Back to the theme of identity, being able to claim and be proud of it, the Time Magazine article states that many Asian Americans that had to persevere through stereotypes and racism growing up didn't find any kind of self-affirmation until reaching college where they're able to be around more Asian students. It's there that they were able to embrace their heritage, which became a social awakening for them. 
An example mentioned in the Time article involves a Japanese American student who grew up in Anchorage, Alaska and dropped out of her Japanese language school because she didn't feel Japanese. She attended a college where more than 10% of the students were Asian American. In growing up Asian and American, Nota mentions that she was not able to know how it felt to be an American and to identify oneself as that when almost everyone else around her would deny that. And it's probably why most Asian Americans in general become so attached to their heritage as they grow up. It's that difficulty in identifying as an American, but coming to realize that your roots and your culture are always going to be there with you to find and fully embrace. That being said, one of the many aspects about the United States that many citizens forget about is that this is a nation built by immigrants. Asian Americans may be mocked and stereotyped by others, but we must consider that American culture is a blend of so many diverse aspects and cultures that they come from the many people who come to live here from other countries and nations. It's that understanding amongst our society that will hopefully change as time moves forward and everyone isn't so blinded and preoccupied with stereotypes and cultural misunderstandings. Okay, that's it for our review of our two readings and we'll move on to our next slide. Okay, let's talk about Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan is an American singer, songwriter, author, and visual artist. Widely regarded as one of the greatest songwriters of all time, Bob Dylan was born Robert Allen Zimmerman. His Hebrew name is Shabbati Zitzel Ben. Abraham, who was born in 1941 in Duluth, Minnesota. Dylan's paternal grandparents immigrated from Odessa in the Ukraine to the United States due to anti-Semitism in 1905. His maternal grandparents were Lithuanian Jews who arrived in the United States in 1902. Dylan has been a major figure in popular culture for more than 50 years. Much of his most celebrated work dates from the 1960s when songs such as Blowing in the Wind and Times They Are a Changing became anthems for the civil rights and anti-war movements. His lyrics during this period incorporated a range of political, social, philosophical, and literary influences, defined pop music conventions, and appealed to the burgeoning counterculture. Blowing in the Wind, Bob Dylan's classic 1962 protest song, has had a long, rich life as an anthem for causes from civil rights to nuclear disarmament. In this song, the speaker poses a series of huge questions about the persistence of war and oppression, and then responds with one repeat, repeated cryptic reply. The answer, my friend, is blown in the wind. Finding an end to human cruelty, the song suggests it's a matter of understanding a truth that's all around us, but paradoxically impossible to grasp. Since, 19, since 1994, 
Uh, Dylan has published eight books of drawings and paintings, and his work has been exhibited in major art galleries. He has sold more than 100 million records, making him one of the best-selling music artists of all time. He has received numerous awards, including the Presidential Medal of Free Freedom, 10 Grammy Awards, a Golden Globe Award, and an Academy Award. Dylan has been introduced into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Nashville Songwriters Hall of Fame, and the Songwriters Hall of Fame. The Pulitzer Prize Board of 2008 awarded him a special citation for his profound impact on popular music and American culture, marked by lyrical compositions of extraordinary poetic power. In 2016, Dylan was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature for having created new poetic expressions within the great American song tradition. Bob Dylan's poem, All Along the Watchtower, uh, here's a, an analysis of that poem. All Along the Watchtower was written and recorded by Bob Dylan. It appeared on his 1967 album, John Wesley Harding, and is now considered to be one of his greatest compositions. It has since appeared on numerous compilations of his music. The song ranked as number 47 on Rolling Stone's 500 Greatest Songs of All Time. It has been covered by many artists such as Jimi Hendrix and Dave Matthews Band. Here's an analysis of All Along the Watchtower. All Along the Watchtower contains a meaning that is not stated properly in the song. By the first line in the third stanza, All Along the Watchtower, princes keep their view. It becomes clear what the poem is about. Princes are keeping an eye on the borders of their kingdom. The last line says, two riders were approaching, the wind began to howl. It refers to impending danger. Before anything becomes clear, the poet ends the poem, allowing readers to imagine what would have happened in the plot. In the first line, the joker and the thief's conversation are also mysterious. This conversation somehow points to the same tension for which the princes are waiting on the watchtower. In the end, it seems that everyone in the poem is waiting for something to happen, but nobody can tell what is going to happen in Dylan's poem. Lines one through four. There must be some way out of here said the joker to the thief. There's too much confusion. I can't get no relief. Businessman, they drink my wine. Plowmen dig my earth. None of them along the line know what any of it is worth. The first lines of All Along the Watchtower uh, are about uh, two characters, a joker and a thief. He puts the right reader right into the middle of a conversation. The first statement is one of desperation. It is of the moment, something that must be resolved but is lacking in definition. The reader has no idea where here is or what these two characters are doing. The thief and, and the joker are examples of archetypes. 
They represent a larger population through the use of this single simple label. These two are both outsiders, separate from the regular population by their professions and natures. The Joker continues as the speaker, ra raising several grievances and explaining what it is that he wants to escape from. There is confusion, the Joker says. Everything is jumbled up and he can't sort how, how what's right in life. The Joker brings up images of businessmen who drink his wine and benefit from his hard work. This metaphor connects to both the Joker and the thief who are as their label suggests, outside the norm. The businessman and the plowman are used to represent the established order, the leaders of society who decide what gets done and who benefits. Dylan is encouraging a listener to make these connections, but he is not explicitly stating what each element of the song means. Lines four and eight. No reason to get excited, the thief, he kindly spoke. But there are many here among us who feel that life is but a joke. But you and I, we've been through that, and this is not our fate. So let us not talk falsely now, the hour is getting late. In the second verse, the thief replies to the joker. It appears that he's sympathizing with much that the joker has said, but he's not quite so hopeless. He feels that the two of them are not as confused as the joker thinks. They're on the right path, and it's not their fate to have a joke of a life. Lines nine through 12. All along the watchtower, princes kept the view, while all the women came and went, barefoot servants too. Outside in the distance, a wildcat did growl. Two riders were approaching, the wind began to howl. In the final four lines all along the watchtower, the imagery gets stronger. Dylan writes about a watchtower, princes, and the women who came and went. This is the location of the thief and the joker are heading towards. The last time describes them as the two riders. They're on their way to the tower in amongst a dark and suspenseful atmosphere. There's a wildcat growling in the distance and the wind begins to howl in the last line. This is an example of foreshadowing. The two main characters uh, on one side of the castle walled town and the princes and women are on the other. This represents the two very different sides of life. There is a lot that can be read into the imagery and atmosphere of the poem. A listener or reader might ask themselves, what is the coming confrontation? Is it a revolution of some kind or part of society overthrowing the other? Perhaps the two writers are on their way to sort out a better life for themselves. What kind of conversations will they have with the princes? Finally, what happens in the established order of workers and who benefits if it's overthrown? Jimi Hendrix sings Bob Dylan's poem all along the watchtower. James Marshall, Jimi Hendrix, was born in 1942 and dies at a young age in 1970. 
He was born in Seattle, Washington, and was of mixed African-American and Cherokee Native American ancestry. He was an American musician, singer, and songwriter. Although his mainstream career spanned only four years, he is widely regarded as one of the most influential electric guitarists in the history of popular music and one of the most celebrated musicians of the 20th century. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame describes him as arguably the greatest instrumentalist in the history of rock and roll. Please listen to Jimi Hendrix's rendition of Bob Dylan's All Along the Watchtower. Okay, let's talk about uh, Dan McLean and his song, Vincent. Uh, Dan McLean III was born in 1945 in New Rochelle, New York. And he lived in Palm Desert, California during his recording career. He presently lives on a 175 acre farm in Maine. He's an American songwriter, singer, best known for his 1971 hit song, American Pie, an eight minute folk rock cultural touch tone about the loss of innocence of the early rock and roll generation. McLean ancestry is Scottish and Italian. McLean attended night school at Iona College and received a bachelor's degree in business administration in 1968. The song Vincent is a tribute to the 19th century Dutch painter Vincent van Gogh. Starry, starry night, Paint your palette blue and gray. Look out on a summer's day with eyes that know the darkness of my soul. The song references several of Van Gogh's famous paintings, Starry Night, the Sunflower Series, the Potato Eaters, and Wheatfield with Crows. Those words came to Don McLean as he looked at a Vincent van Gogh 1889 painting, The Starry Night. Soon he had a masterpiece of his own, Vincent, a 1972 hit that he released right on the heels of his defining epic, American Pie. Like Vincent van Gogh's painting, Vincent has touched a wide range of creative spirits over the last 50 years. Even Tupac Shakur, who once told the Los Angeles Times, the lyric on that song is so touching. That's how I want to make my songs feel. The client says, I would carry these papers with me, green paper that I found in the garbage in New York. I threw it in my car because I thought they would be great to write songs on. If you see the American Pie lyrics that sold, they were on green paper, kind of brown around the edges now. That, uh, those lyrics uh, scribbled on 14 pages of green paper uh, sold for a million dollars recently. So I had that stuff in the house and I jotted an idea deer or two down on a piece of paper somewhere. And I started to work on this. I was singing into the tape recorder and looking at the Starry Night painting by Vincent van Gogh, it was telling me what to say. I got the wind and the circularity and the breeze. And Ed Freeman, the producer, brought the strings like wind coming in and ruffling the curtains. It was very subtle. I'm not so subtle sometimes, but he was, and that was very nice. 
Anyway, we got the song written because I was there for a week or something. A long time, it seemed like to me. I was singing for a bunch of high school students that night. Pick up $50. Maybe it was 100 It was a prom or something. I don't remember. I sang this new song and they weren't paying much attention. I sang the song and they all stopped. They looked at me. When that happened, I said to myself, wow, this is something nice. I'm really happy with this. I started working on it. When you hear the record, it's just me and the guitar. It's just one take. So let's take a listen to Don McLean's Vincent uh, video with uh, Vincent Van Gogh's uh, paintings uh, listed on your email. Okay, let's talk about the Wizard of Oz. The book was published 120 years ago, written by L. Frank Baum as a children's fantasy novel. Lyman Frank Baum was born in Chitin, Chittenago, New York, in 1856 to a wealthy, devout Methodist family. He had German, Scots Irish, and English ancestry and was the seventh of nine children. Eventually moves to Los Angeles in his adult life. Baum started writing early in life, possibly prompted by his father, who bought him a cheap printing press. He writes The Wizard of Oz in 1900. It becomes a theatrical production, then a movie in 1939, starring Judy Garland. Garland was 16 years old for the filming of The Wizard of Oz. The story The Wizard of Oz, a classic legend, a children's story that will never grow old. Quotes such as, Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Lions and tigers and bears, oh my. And there's no place like home are the ones that will always pop into our heads when someone says, The Wizard of Oz. Dorothy's long adventurous trip down the yellow brick road is something that everyone loves to read and watch. It's a story that touches all of us. Hearing Judy Garland as Dorothy sing Somewhere Over the Rainbow left an impression on every individual who watched the movie. It was as if we felt that she was feeling at the moment that there was a better place somewhere out there over the rainbow, over the rainbow. Viewers were able to relate to a character, whether it was the scarecrow in need of the, a brain, the tin man in need of a heart, or the cowardly lion in need of courage. The obvious message of the story is that there's no place like home, says Lauren Holberg, who wrote an analysis from a Jung psychological point of view. An economic point of view states the story is an allegory for 1900s American economic policy which held the gold standard, a policy linking the value of currency to the value of gold. Impoverished Southerners and Midwesterners wanted silver to be given value again. In Baum's novel, Yellow Brick Road leads to the fraudulent wizard, whereas silver shoes possess immense power. Baum contrasts the bleak landscape of rural Kansas 
with the lush greenery of Oz. In comparison to the Emerald City, Kansas seems miserable and impoverished, which reflects the socioeconomic state of the post-Civil War United States. Eva Cassidy from the No Words, No Song website states, the song Somewhere Over the Rainbow, written by Yip Harburg, has been interpreted to mean that human beings are dreamers. We all want to be somewhere else, doing something else, and sometimes with someone else. But we've got mortgages, families, responsibilities, bills to pay, a position in society to keep up. Even people who consider themselves outside mainstream society have their position as an outsider to keep up, so there's no escape. The sense of, sense of wanting to be somewhere else, dreaming of a happier place, is exactly what Yip Harburg so beautifully conjures up in his lyrics. Is Israel Kama Kaiwa was an Hawaiian singer, lyricist, musician, and Hawaiian sovereignty activist. His melody of Somewhere Over the Rainbow was subsequently featured in several films television programs, and commercials. So let's take time to watch Israel's music video listed in your e email, Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Okay, so on this slide here, we're gonna talk about a commencement address entitled Sunscreen by Mary Shamich of the Chicago Tribune. Uh, it was written in 1997. Advice, like youth, probably just wasted on the young. Inside every adult lurks a graduation speaker dying to get out. Some world-weary pundit eager to pontificate on life to young people who'd rather be rollerblading. Most of us, alas, will never be invited to sow our words of wisdom among an audience of cap and gowns, but there's no reason we can't entertain ourselves by composing a guide to life for graduates. I encourage everyone over 26 to try this and thank you for indulging my attempt. Ladies and gentlemen of the class of 97, wear sunscreen. If I could offer you only one tip for the future, sunscreen would be it. The long-term benefits of sunscreen have been proved by scientists Whereas the rest of my advice has no basis more reliable than my own meandering experience, I will dispense that advice now. Enjoy the power and beauty of your youth. Oh, never mind. You will not understand the power and beauty of your youth until they fade it. But trust me, in 20 years, you look back at photos of yourself and recall in a way you can't grasp now how much possibility lay before you and how fabulous you really looked. You're not as fat as you imagined. Don't worry about the future or worry, but know that worrying is as effective as trying to solve an algebra equation by chewing bubble gum. The real troubles in your life are apt to be things that never crossed your worried mind. They kind of blindside you at 4 p.m. on some idle Tuesday. Do one thing every day that scares you. 
sing. Don't be reckless with other people's hearts. And don't put up with people who are reckless with yours. Floss. Don't waste your time on jealousy. Sometimes you're ahead. Sometimes you're behind. The race is long. And in the end, it's only with yourself. Remember compliments you receive. Forget the insults. If you succeed in doing this, tell me how. Keep your old love letters. Throw away your old bank statements. Stretch. Don't feel guilty if you don't know what you want to do with your life. The most interesting people I know didn't know at 22 what they wanted to do with their lives. Some of the most interesting 40-year-olds I know still don't. Get plenty of calcium. Be kind to your knees. You'll miss them when they're gone. Maybe you'll marry. Maybe you won't. Maybe you'll have children. Maybe you won't. Maybe you'll divorce at 40. Maybe you'll dance the funky chicken on your 75th wedding anniversary. Whatever you do, don't congratulate yourself too much or berate yourself either. Your choices are half chance. So are everyone else's. Enjoy your body. Use it every way you can. Don't be afraid of it or what other people think of it. It's the greatest instrument you'll ever own. Dance even if you have nowhere to do it but your living room. Read the directions, even if you don't follow them. Do not read beauty magazines. They will only make you feel ugly. Get to know your parents. You never know when they'll be gone for good. Be nice to your siblings. They're your best link to your past and the people most likely to stick with you in the future. Understand that friends come and go, but with a precious few, you should hold on. Work hard to bridge the gaps in geography and lifestyle, because the older you get, the more you need the people who knew you when you were young. Live in New York City once, but leave before it makes you hard. Live in Northern California once, but leave before it makes you soft. Travel. Accept certain inalienable truths. Prices will rise. Politicians will philander. You too will get old. And when you do, you'll fantasize that when you were young, prices were reasonable. Politicians were noble, and children respected their elders. Respect your elders. Don't expect anyone else to support you. Maybe you have a trust fund. Maybe you'll have a wealthy spouse. But you never know when either one might run out. Don't mess too much with your hair, or by the time you're 40, you'll look 85. Be careful whose advice you buy. Be patient with those who supply it. Advice is a form of nostalgia. Dispensing it is a way of fishing the past from the disposal, wiping it off, painting over the ugly parts, and recycling it for more than it's worth. But trust me, on the sunscreen. Mary Schumach. Okay, so let's do a quick wrap up of where we've been for the past three months. So the uh, course examined uh, literature from First Nations mythology and creation stories to contemporary American literature 
from the geographic locations of East Coast Yankee New Netherlands, the left coast. Additionally, we discussed American literature from a multicultural perspective through short stories, poetry, music as poetry, street art as literature, and film. Some of the themes we examine concern the struggle of identity, race relations, and cultural and linguistic conformity. So these are what we covered for materials. Native American literature, Ben Franklin's remarks concerning the savages of North America, uh, Roger Williams' uh, sermon poem, uh, Boast Not Proud English, talked about Jack London's story, Quiche, Mary Whitebird's story, Tanika, and some poetry from Hawaii. From there, we talked about Joseph Bruchak's story, Skins, and we started our New England literature starting with Samuel Woodworth's poem, Old Oak and Bucket, Robert Frost, The Meandering Wall and the Gift Outright. We talked about uh, Billy Joel's uh, song, Down Easter Alexa. Elliot Lurie's uh, The Looking Glass song, Brandy. We introduced uh, Peter Benchley and his novel Jaws, and we discussed the uh, movie Jaws as a modern day adaptation of Herman Melville's Moby Dick. Then we talked about Mary Wilkins Freeman's story, A New England Nun, John Updike's short story, A and P, Elizabeth Van Steenwick's story, The Comeback. We discussed uh, a novel called An Abundance of Catherines by John Green. We talked about Simon Garfunkel's song, The Boxer, and Billy Joel's uh, music, New York State of Mind. We read O. Henry's story after 20 years and Nalikalesa Moore's story, Shoes for Hector, along with Pyrie Thomas's Amigo Brothers. From there, we talked about Arthur Lawrence's book and theatrical production, West Side Story. And we talked about a song written by Leonard Bernstein called America. We also talked about Luis Gluck's poem, Red Poppy, a Janice Ian song, Society's Child, Emma Lazarus' poem, The New Colossus. We talked about Santana's song, Maria Maria and a photo essay by Ben Davidson concerning the gangs of New York. We talked about West Side Story as cultural appropriation, a critique by Vivian Vargas, and some short video vignettes of the less traveled roads of unique, unique uh, New York. We read Sarah Adams' Coolness to the Pizza Dude, the street art of Jean-Michel Basquat, the poet. We talked about Steely Dan's song, The Royal Scam, and a song written by George Gershwin, sung by Tony Bennett and Lady Gaga. 
from here, we went to the left coast and talked about a song, Hotel California, and a song by America called Ventura Highway. We talked about Asian American experience, the Fun Brothers video, Asians Eat Weird Things, the life and works of Amy Tan, her two stories, Fish Cheeks and Two Kinds. We listened to a poem read by Allen Ginsberg, The Supermarket in California. And we looked at Edwin Markham's A Man with a Hope. From here, we talked about the book and movie Seabiscuit. We talked about contemporary author Hunter S. Thompson and his novel, Hell's Angels, a magazine called Rolling Stone. We introduced Esperanza Spalding as 21st century jazz genius and her song, City of Roses. We talked about Philip Levine reading his poem, The Simple Truth. We introduced Ambrose Bierce and his story and an occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge. We read Toshi Mori's Sick Road of Pong Pongs and Kaiseya Noda's Growing Up Asian in America. And then finally, today's lesson was Bob Dylan and Jimi Hendrix uh, all along the Watchtower, uh, Dan McLean's uh, Vincent, uh, Native Hawaiian Israel is somewhere over the rainbow from the movie The Wizard of Oz, and some parting advice by Mary Schmidt of the Chicago Tribune called Sunscreen. So it's been a long journey. We've covered a lot of territory. Absolute pleasure to uh, teach this class. So in addition to the research paper, please write a review of the course. Tell me something you like, something you learned, uh, whatever. Uh, let me know how the course uh, affected you in any way. And again, it was a pleasure to work with all of you. And good luck to you on your final exams for the term. And hope to see you again my next time back at Debrecen University. Okay, thank you.